Um, I'm going to talk about something a little more conservative, and those are best practices. Um, first up, I was just said, wow, that's my head and really big. Um, <laughs> wow. Um, I was just introduced, but I'm just going to do it real quick anyways. I'm a front-end dev in Karlsruhe at Punkt.de. Um, I've been um, a core team member for like half a year, maybe. I don't know. Um, and you can find me on Twitter at Maya Shines. All right, let's get into this. Um, as I mentioned, I want to talk about the first draft of the best practices. They were set up at the last or second to last code sprint in Salzburg by the core team. Um, I was approached and asked to present them to you because uh, the core team feels like it's very, very important to make them publicly known, make them very transparent, make everybody know that they're there and what they are. Um, Essentially, it's just a set of guidelines, rules, a framework for you to figure out your project. Um, and I will be committing the ultimate sin of any presentation ever, and that is reading off slides, because as much as I love you, I wasn't going to learn those by heart. Um, so I tried my best to avoid death by uh, PowerPoint, also because this is Keynote and not PowerPoint. Um, so napping is allowed, but disencouraged, but I wouldn't be able to tell because I can't see you anyways. Um, I've enriched my slides a little bit with personal experiences rather than and deviating a little from, from the best practices. I'm going to make sure to point those out so you don't confuse my opinions with the core team um, opinions. Let's get into it. Um, the wording is based entirely on the RFC 2119, which defines a set of terms um, to clarify 10 different levels, levels of severity in best practices. Six of those are used by uh, the best practices of NEOS. Um, those are must not, should not, may, recommended, should, and must. Um, I tried to color code those. I think it's kind of visible. Um, one last thing, one last disclaimer. Obviously, if you know what you're doing, you can happily deviate from all the best practices. Um, you just have to know what the consequences might be. Um, let's get into it. I want to start with the distributions. Um, they're, I think, the second to last chapter in the official best practices, but I think when you set up a project, that's where you start. Um, and uh, yeah, let's let the reading begin. NEOS projects should be managed as a single Git repository that contains all packages that are specific to this project. Uh, the alternative, which is taking your individual packages and putting them into separate Git repositories, will cause you a management overhead. You're going to have to uh, commit them and update them and make sure that everything is in the right order, and who wants that? Manage and maintain one Git repository, have everything clean and orderly. <sighs> this whole breathing thing, scary. All right. Um, the packages folder should be controlled um, should only be controlled by Composer. This keeps your Git ignore clean, which is awesome. Everybody likes a lightweight Git ignore. Um, also, it allows you to rely on the dependency management that Composer brings, which also saves you so much hassle. And it allows you to rely on Composer's auto loading for classes. Um, all your own project specific packages must be stored in, spe in a special directory like distribution packages that is referenced as a repository of type path in the main composer file. So this is like a really long sentence to essentially say, put your source code in one directory and have that be loaded by composer. Might look like something like this. Um, when I first read this, I was like, what, what why? why would I do that? I don't get it. Um, until I realized we had been doing that the whole time. Just that directory was called source and not distribution packages. All right, next chapter, note types. Um, each note type should be defined in a dedicated YAML file, and the file name must represent the namespace of the contained note types. This just aims at keeping your code uh, manageable and tidy. Um, I came across a legacy project a while back that had one notypes.yaml file, and it was scary. It was like hundreds, thousands of lines of configuration. There was no chance of even finding out what node types this project had without going through this monstrosity. It was scary. Don't do that. 
Don't do that to yourself. Don't do that to your coworkers. Don't do that to yourself in eight weeks. Don't do it. The namespace of your own node types should be structured and nested, kind of like this. Um, regardless of what the files are called, internally, all files that start with node types dot whatever, whatever, awesome element dot YAML are merged into a single node type uh, definition configuration array. So Neos really doesn't care about this. You're doing this for yourself. Um, the convention serves for, for manageability and, um, and convenience for you developers and integrators. Uh, quick side note, this manner of namespacing uh, is now also possible with the settings files, so maybe you want to do that. Okay, it is recommended to start with one of the following prefixes. Um, you can call it a document or content or collection, which would in turn inherit from Nias Nias document, Nias Nias content, and Nias Nias content collection. And a little more spicy and exciting, there are mixins, which are um, abstract and define a reusable set of properties or allowed child nodes. Um, and then there's constraints, which are also abstract and they define the allowed usage of nodes. The, um, Neos, uh, the node type files that modify node types from other packages must have override in the file name. This is, again, mainly for clarity, because if you run into a definition and it doesn't clearly say override, you might be wondering, like, this is not a lot of properties, when in reality it just overwrites one um, property. So um, I was already at this point tired of making like fake code examples, directory snippets, so I just grabbed one from a live project of ours. Um, this is a great example of the usage of naming your files something something override. It's a terrible example for um, that rule of having one node type in one file because we have that nasty override YAML over there. It's, you don't want to do that, but you know, it's real. <laughs> Don't tell me your code doesn't look a little iffy in some places. Um, yeah, one more perk um, if you like name things properly. If you use one of the JetBrains IDEs like PHP Storm, you can install the NEOS support plugin by Christian Vette. Vette? Does anybody know? I haven't met him. I, I don't want to mispronounce his name. Um, and uh, there you can actually click on the name of any node type and be like reference to the definitions, which includes the overrides, which is really useful. Uh, obviously, the plugin does other great things like syntax highlightings and um, resource references for Fusion, and it's fantastic. Install it. It will make your life so much easier. OK. Um, sub node types that are bound to a specific parent node type should have a name matching said parent. Um, this totally makes sense if you think about it, because like if you have something that's always going to appear somewhere else, you have a slider with a slide, you have an accordion with an accordion item, you might as well name them accordingly, right? Properties should only be editable by a single editor, either inline or in the inspector. Um, allowing editors to access the same properties inline and in the property inspector will cause harm eventually. Like if the settings are just slightly off, you're going to get yourself in trouble. Um, so you have to decide when you, when you implement a new property where to put it. Um, there are kind of easy ways to think about it. Um, until 20 minutes ago, I had never seen anyone inline create images. That kind of blew me away. So actually, my slide notes say, I've never seen anybody, but now I have, so I can't read that anymore. This is a problem. Uh, what I haven't seen even now is a date picker inline. So if you have a date picker, you're probably going to put that in the property inspector. Um, in my experience, and this is my experience, not the official best practices, uh, you can roast me for this, not for anything else that I've said. Um, it seems to me to make sense to differentiate, to differentiate between content on one hand and attributes on the other. For instance, if you have a blog article about last year's NeosCon, um, this will have a set of properties, like a title and a subtitle and a text body, but it will also have an author or maybe categories that it's listed under or a publish date. Um, so in my experience, it makes sense to make, to put the meat of the article in 
the content canvas. This is what your website visitor comes for. This is what he wants to see. Um, and everything else that's kind of metadata, so shove it in that property inspector. Um, OK. Each node type property must be valid after creating a new node. Um, so essentially, if, you create, if your editor creates a new node and uh, the node needs to be filled, but it's not filled, then it's going to crash and burn, and everyone's going to be really upset. Um, so either you create reasonable defaults, new title, or you allow the property to be empty. There is a third way, though. Um, disclaimer, my experience. There is this beautiful package named Flowpack Node Templates that allows you to fill in, in the creation dialog, certain values and um, like the author, categories. And um, when the editor saves or creates um, all these values that are put in will automatically be filled in where they need to be, which gets you around the problem of setting defaults or um, allowing it to be empty. Um, obviously, that uh, package, no templates, was originally made for something else. It's just like a nice side effect. It's actually initially created to um, configure nodes that are auto-created within each other to save your editors from endlessly, manually create, create, insert, into, insert. In Has anybody ever been there? I've been there. Horrible. Um, OK, so no templates. Super useful. Um, the NIAS NIAS no types package should not be used directly. This is, from what I understand, a legacy problem because the NIAS NIAS no type package itself includes like all the node types, all of them. Um, and that also includes no types that you might not want your editors to get their grubby hands on. Um, for example, HTML elements. Anybody ever have an editor that really wanted to write HTML themselves? Um, so if you include NIOS, NIOS, no types, it comes with all of this, and then you're going to have to, you, yourself, like, pick them out again and disallow them, and like, just, it's so much, like, it bloats. It's, nobody wants that. Um, it's way better to include individual packages whenever you need them rather than taking this whole blubber with it. What you may do instead is use the mixins from NIOS, NIOS, no types base mixins. Because it comes with like all these tiny little useful, great mixins that will enrich your custom node types. There are like links and text and title and image and all these fun things that come without the bloat. Um, we recommend to create node types in the project namespace. Uh, this is basically for clarity to like set your custom node types apart. Um, and yeah. A no type should only inherit from a single non-abstract supertype. All our other supertypes should be mixins or constraints. Uh, composition over inheritance is the name of this song that we're singing, because if you rely solely on in inheritance, um, you may end up defining a property, but then something inherits from that, but you don't want that to have that property, so you overwrite it, and then you inherit from that, but you need that property from earlier, so you, and then you end up with this messy chain of inheritance, and it's like, I've been there, it was awful. Um, in the end, what we did, the better approach, is to um, merge unrelated properties into whatever magical construct of properties you need, rather than getting yourself into that mess. Fusion. All right. So the root fusion in a project must not contain anything but includes. Like I said, at this point, I was well done and tired of creating fake code snippets for this presentation. So I just went into a live project and stole the root fusion from that one. And I hope our customer is going to be OK with that, because I've published it now. Um, yeah, don't hide your, <laughs> don't hide your shamefully unstructured fusion code in a file. Like, just don't. Um, fusion files should only contain a single prototype. And the folder and file names must reflect the names of the contained prototypes. This is pretty much analogous to what I said earlier. Actually, I th said pretty much the exact same thing earlier regarding node types. Um, it keeps your, your uh, directories manageable and tidy, and it, it enables you to find things. Um, 
the Fusion prototype na namespace should be structured and nested. You'll notice that it says structured and nested, but it doesn't tell you how to structure or nest. Um, so again, this is, I think, a customer project. I don't think I made this up. I may have made this up. At this point, I don't even remember. Um, we're doing the atomic thing with the molecules and the organisms, but we also have this overrides in the no types file, and we just, it works for our team. We know where to find things. We know where to put things. We talked about it. We understand. But then I talked to Martin, and Martin told me that they do it like this. Uh, they have a separation between integration and presentation, and within those directories, they have more directories. And um, so it's like a matter of, it's at the discretion of you and your team to figure out how to sort things, but keep them structured and nested. Um, another upside to keeping everything named and structured properly is that um, when you search for a file, it, they're so much easier to locate because I know now that all of these are somehow related to slides or sliders. And if I look for something with slides or sliders, I can find it. OK. It is recommended to start with one of the following prefixes. I've said this before, too, haven't I? Um, there's content and document, which you know is the NEOS, NEOS document, NEOS, NEOS content. Um, and then there's component, which is the basis for uh, making your reusable atomic things. And then there's a helper, which uh, I didn't understand at first. I had to talk to someone and ask them what a helper does. And when they explained it to me, again, I realized we're already doing that. So it's more of a naming thing than a doing it. Um, helpers are non-presentational calculations or queries. So for instance, um, in one of our projects, we have to construct really complex Elasticsearch queries um, that we want to reuse, but with different parameters depending on so, and these calculations are built within one of those helpers. Um, and then there's presentation and integration. Um, presentational prototypes will be the ones that are completely agnostic to where the data comes from. They just have it. They don't care where it comes from. They have the data, but they know what it's supposed to look like. They know um, what comes first, and what's a div, and what's a span, and they take care of HTML rendering. It's the quasi front end. Um, and the integrational parts are the ones that have no idea what it's supposed to look like, but they do know how to get it. So they query the content repository, they traverse through your data, they pick and choose the data that you need, and then hand it on to the presentational layer to make it look right. OK. Uh, each non-abstract node type should have a matching Fusion prototype. This is the default uh, way of NEOS to find a matching renderer for your, for your node types. Um, and it makes the code super easy to understand. In the former times, uh, long ago, the prototype generator uh, used to allow you to define, just define HTML. And then NEOS would auto-magically take the um, node type and the HTML and create the fusion that belongs and glues them together. Uh, but this is now usually overwritten with custom prototype definitions for each node type. We recommend to abstract code into Fusion prototypes that are not bound to node types and reuse them across the project. This is something that you might do, for example, with a helper. Reuse your code. Don't rewrite your code over and over. Um, yeah. Fusion prototypes with the prefixes content and document should implement the rendering of a content or document node type. And Fusion prototypes with the component prefix should implement reusable rendering aspects. I feel like I read a lot of these slides, and they're very self-explanatory. <laughs> um, but I can skip them. Um, so this makes sense, because com uh, content and document and component node types all have like different requirements. They have different needs. So give them the rendering that fills their needs. Uh, so yeah, it's only clean and reasonable to render a note with, like, according to its type. This might make some people sad, from what I gather. Um, the rendering of content should be defined in Fusion AFX. Um, every day, at least, or maybe every week, I see people asking questions about and like posting uh, snippets from their Fluid in Slack and Discuss. So I realize that it's like still very alive, um, and they will still be supported. It's just not considered best practice anymore. Um, 
the great thing about Fusion FX is that it takes your quasi HTML and turns it into these really reusable Fusion tags that like you can you're so free to overwrite just the tiniest part of it because you want to reuse the whole thing but that tiny thing needs to be different. You know your customers. They want that one little thing to be different somewhere else. And you're like, why? And they're like, because. And then mar marketing said, and then you're like, oh, well, if marketing said. Um, so you need to overwrite this one little detail. And no, are you going to rewrite it? No, you're not. You're just going to use Fusion AFX and just overwrite this tiny little part. Um, yeah. Fusion files that modify prototypes uh, from other packages must have override in the file or folder name. Again, I'm repeating myself. This is completely analogous to no types. Just make it clear in the like path or the name of your file what it is. I just keep seeing the, saying the same thing. <laughs> um, visual differentiations between documents should be implemented via separate document no types and not by overriding the layout property of the Nios Nios no types page. Um, this used to be done like this. We don't want to do that anymore. There are a few reasons. Um, for instance, uh, like different pages have different, often have different um, properties. Like for example, a page that collects all blog articles into an overview is going to have radically different properties from a start page or a contact form page. Um, so, you know, reflect that in your note type. Uh, also, it makes it easier for your editors. Your editors can, like, gain an, like, an association to the icons. They know that this is in the note tree. They recognize, oh, yeah, this is obviously a page with a different layout, a different something. Um, and they can filter the page, uh, the page tree for the types. And so can you in your Fusion. You can filter for the uh, page types that you need. OK. I'm getting better at the breathing thing, I feel like, right? I'm doing the in now. It's awesome. Um, for larger projects, the presentational prototypes should be separated from integration. I talked about this earlier. Um, you can do this by uh, splitting them in different files. However, the presentational Fusion prototypes must implement rendering aspects only without fetching data from the content repository. Like I said earlier, these presentational no types are not supposed to, uh, prototypes are not just supposed to know anything about where this data comes from. Um, if you're really diligent with that separation between integration and presentation, Monocle might be the thing for you. With Monocle, you, you can um, test your presentational fusion prototypes with static placeholders and like static data well before the no types or the querying or whatever else needs to be done is even implemented. Um, it was discussed at length whether or not to put the recommendation to use Monocle into the best practices. The only reason that it didn't make it into the best practices isn't that it isn't great, because it is great. Um, it's just that it felt a little iffy to put a third-party package uh, into the best practices, because then the next question would be, why don't you just put it in your core? And then I mean, we still might. So it might end up in the best practices eventually. So I wanted to mention it. It is like a kind of best practice. Um, yeah, the package comes highly recommended, especially if you need to implement like a living style guide. Um, so I wanted to have it mentioned. If you need any further information on this, feel free. Go ahead. Do not ask me. Ask Martin. He's here. I can't. Whoop, he's right there. Uh, he's so passionate about this. He's a co-developer of Monocle. Um, if you ask, he'll tell you anything. I asked him, and he told me a lot, and it was, I learned a lot. He's super excited about it. Talk to him about Monocle. Um, yeah, and then in the, the great spirit of open source communities, we want to talk about what to keep in mind if you want to make your code available to anyone else, really. Um, we recommend to separate reusable mix-ins, helpers, and prototypes from concrete no types, configurations, and rendering. So basically, this is the whole, you know, the parts that do things and the part that make things look a certain way. Keep those separate so that someone else might reuse the part that does something. Um, yeah, this makes it super easy to only use specific parts of your uh, package. You may also provide uh, presentational components 
without a direct cou uh, coupling to the node types. This, again, just makes your package easier to be uh, like flexible for other developers. All right, with all the non-breathing and like being super scared of all of you, I may have gone a little fast. Um, but yeah, if, you, if you're curious about any of this, you can read up on it or ask me, although please don't. Um, and then, again, in the great spirit of uh, open source communities, all these pictures were open source and they're beautiful and I feel like the photographer's names should at least just pop up here for a second. And now, thank you very much, have some lunch, and I'm gonna go sweat somewhere else now. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Maya. <laughs>